a lot of it is a is a dissatisfaction with current systems, states, corporations, and that feeling of wanting to, to start something afresh and build community uh, in this new, more global kind of context and way. Yeah, I remember the initial kind of ideas around this regenerative network state, taking some of the, mm. the really interesting ideas of, of how you form this decentralized you know, society uh, with communities all over the globe mm. and how you kind of create the infrastructure to coordinate globally and actually have real impact. Hey, what's going on, Refine Nation? John Ellison here, bringing a bonus episode with a very special guest and a good friend of mine. Monty Merlin flew in from the UK to be here with me in Lisbon at our new studio as a part of this exploration of a network to regenerate the earth. Over the last six or seven months, we've been playing with this idea of a network state. Balaji from Coinbase, former CTO, now at A16Z, seemed to have a major download last year around a new type of organizational structure, an online community that decentralizes into physical local communities to acquire land, take action, and ultimately gain diplomatic recognition. But as we took this new umbrella term of Refi DAO into the community, we experienced an incredible amount of tension and conflict as we look at the real political divide of bringing these powerful coordination technologies into the real world with the shared resources that we actually all need to survive. And I wanted to bring in Monty to look at this exposition of work that we've been doing over the last couple months around what is a network state? Is it the right vehicle? And are there actually alternative options to fulfill similar outcomes without incurring similar risks? So without further ado, super, super stoked to welcome you, Monty, to the show. <laughs> How's it going, man? Welcome to Lisbon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. Uh, Lisbon is awesome. <laughs> and uh, super excited to be in this really cool setup and, and jam on this incredibly interesting, nuanced and quite contentious debate around network states uh, and, and really start to do some visioning um, of, of what Refi DAO could become and, and what we could all do together to unlock this uh, regenerative world we all want to see. So uh -huh. super excited yeah, to get into it. Definitely. <laughs> Before we do, I want to drop us into a little meditation. Obviously, at Refi DAO, all of our one-to-ones, yeah. uh, we have about two minutes together and um, really just invite listeners, wherever you are, driving your car or washing the dishes, or even just working out. Um, if you can, close your eyes and just give me two minutes before we drop into this really special episode. I'm going to play a little music here as a background and we'll get into things. You can breathe in through your nose, allowing your nervous system to settle. Feeling the weight of gravity pulling you down. The heartbeat in your chest. The gift of life that it brings. And the recognition that this moment is all we've got. If you'd like, you can imagine all the other listeners scattered around the world, dreaming of this new earth where people on the planet can finally live together in harmony. You are not alone. You are part of something so much bigger, so much more powerful. Thanks for going there with us, Monty. Yeah, I always love that uh, 
little cultural tradition, I guess, that we, we have again. <laughs> <laughs> Some people find it awkward, but yeah. most people jump into it and love it. Um, yeah. Well, mate, I'd, I'd love to start off with a bit about you. I remember when we first met, you kind of hounded me on Twitter. You're like, yo, watch my fucking TED Talk. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did, I was like, okay, this this kid's got swag. We need to hang out. And uh, yeah, he came over to my house and we formed a really nice friendship. Um, but for those who haven't had the pleasure of sharing sitting room time with you, who are you, man? What's your journey been? Yeah, it's, it's a good it's a good question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I grew up in, in rural Dorset uh, in the UK um, um, with a kind of passionate family, to say the least. Um, yeah, my my mum's been an environmentalist for 40 years, written 20 plus books, um, and yeah, really pioneered this green consumer movement, uh, which we can dive into a little bit. Um, but really, yeah, from from a very young age, I was learning about all these issues um, and discussing them in, in depth. Uh, and at the same time uh, as being an environmentalist, I've always been kind of a techie and interested in building things and creating um, and so that's always been a kind of part of my kind of creative explorations. Um, and, and then diving into economics and philosophy. And, and so, yeah, obviously crypto uh, has a lot of those elements, uh, <laughs> but it never had the environmentalism. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it was quite the opposite, right? Um, um, until this refi movement was born uh, when I was... Um, so I went to university in Bristol, uh, studied in a, a really amazing course combining lots of business and startup methodologies um, with actually doing the thing. Uh, uh, so instead of writing a dissertation for my master's, you launch a startup uh, in kind of so multidisciplinary sick. teams. Oh man, I wish that would my Computer education. science, <laughs> economics, all get it together. Uh, and, yes. you know, I was fortunate that the refi movement was born at that time. And mm. obviously I just became obsessed and um, went super deep, uh, started launching my own startup, uh, did the TED Talk. And then of course, uh, we cross paths, which I'm mm. super grateful for, and it's it's been a hell of a journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. You talk about it, it's like, man, it's been a year, and I was like, no, mate, it's only been like six months, <laughs> six, seven months. There's a lot that's happened, um, having so much fun. And I'm curious, before we dive into stuff around like Refi DAO and your perspective on the journey, the network state, um, talk a little bit around your early childhood experiences and your awareness around people and the planet. Mm. I think you had a particularly unique upbringing in the way that has prepared you to be fully invested in this movement. Mm. And it gives me a lot of hope. I mean, there's only eight years between us. It's not a big divide. But as I'm a father of two young boys, like I really yearn for them to have this free, unabashed passion mm. to create beauty in the world and really understand you know, the complex crises of our planets and not just sit around you know, throwing cans of soup at the wall, but actually building mm. stuff to create a better world. Is there anything like specific memory that comes to you that really sat with you, the kind of potency of the challenges and the opportunity that it holds? Yeah, so I think, like I say, we came up in this family where there was a lot of um, kind of, a lot of deep discussions. I mean, our, our, our dinner tables were never like, uh, you know, we always really went deep on topics uh, um, and that's always just kind of been a part of my family life. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so as well as being uh, an author, my mom is also like a campaigner and an activist. And so she's very outspoken. She's a <laughs> bit of a superwoman in this regards. Um, and yeah, I, th I think part of the, the realizations that I've had over the years is, is, you know, how we shift the conversation as well from um, this kind of, individual action uh, which is super important as well but also going a step a step above that as well mm. to like think how can we really redesign things um in a kind of deep way um and so that's been been an interesting journey to go on as well because yeah like i say there was this green consumer movement where uh, previously it, all of the environmental movements were like Screw you, business. You're wrecking the planet, and sure. the business You're was the like, enemy. Screw you, right back. Like we're just going to continue <laughs> doing do it. it. Then. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, part of this green consumer movement was how do you actually get businesses to change by by changing your habits to buy products which are more better for the planet, basically. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that sends the signal that then drives them to make this change. And I think it was a really pertinent kind of time that that happened, and it, it spawned this big movement. But I think we've very much now seen the limits limit, of that. Yeah. And, and you know, we see all this greenwashing, and we see this almost kind of shifting of responsibility onto individual action. You know, we know that 
um, the term carbon footprint was actually sure. invented by oil companies. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's convenient. And, it's your problem. And, and really, like if you live in a in a in a world where it's systemically designed that every action you take is having a negative impact on the people around you and on the planet at large, um, then there's something fundamentally wrong. And mm -hmm. you know, we need to, as well as having this um, bottoms up movement, we really need to see how that can actually create the top yes. top down change um, that we need to see. Uh, and so that's what's really exciting for me about uh, the, the movement that we're, we're going to talk about um, because I feel like there's a there's a roadmap to get get all mm. the hippies uh, and the builders and the founders all super aligned and connected and coordinated across the globe so we can really do this stuff for real. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It's quite interesting what you said, you know, if you live in a system where any action you take has a negative impact on other people on the planet, then something's fundamentally broken. Mm. Because I think a lot of other movements had a theory of change that didn't fully recognize this. And I'm curious what you've seen as the kind of evolution of your thought pattern around, okay, this is what's important. This is how we're going to change the system. And what was it in ReFi that made you think like, okay, actually this is the key to unlock radical change in our lifetime? Mm, mm. Yeah, it's a really good point. And one personal observation as well on, on that is, is often a, a kind of critique that's leveled at campaigners uh, and activists and environmentalists is, well, you drive a car. You, uh, you know, you have traveled before. You're wearing clothes that are made of plastic. And it's like, well, okay, like, uh, do you expect anyone who cares about these issues to live in a mud hut? At which point <laughs> uh, no you call them crazy. <laughs> uh, but like, to just exist in this modern world, that, that, uh, that is uh, what happens. So, um, so yeah, so, so for me, it's, it's also just a recognition that the, finan that the systems that we've built on a global macro level are, are out of date. They, they've kind of pioneered this industrial mindset, the industrial revolution, you know, capitalist economics, GDP growth, globalization, all of these systems, they've had incredible growth. They've been incredibly mm. successful at maximizing mm. what they were designed to do, GDP, which um, has benefited many, but it's also bene not bene it's, it's been terrible for, for the planet. And now we're seeing, you know, increasing inequality and uh, it's, it's hurt a lot of people. Um, and I think we've, we've very much reached the limits uh, of that system. And it's calling out for the next generation uh, world order, essentially. And for mm. me, that it's got to be regeneration, where we redesign the fundamental drivers that, are, that um, people, you know, this invisible hand of, mm -hmm. of market mm -hmm. forces that seemingly drives all of our, our behaviors on sure. such a giant, massive systemic level across the entire globe. Like, that is a serious coordination mechanism. But at the moment, it's just driving financial capital and extraction of that yes. for, to benefit the elites and the powerful. Increasingly efficiently. Uh, increasingly efficiently and compounding in, an, in, in this way. So, like, it, it's just broken. Uh, and what I loved about seeing the refi movement was there was actual... Uh, a real kind of taking these ideas of regenerative economics and, and some of the theory and applying these super powerful technologies that are em emerging, of course, Web3, decentralized ledger technology, blockchains, uh, but also with AI and advanced measurement reporting verification. And so really bringing those building blocks, uh, hopefully marrying them with the, mm. the theory and all of the amazing academic work that's gone into understanding regeneration yes. and then how that all combines um, to actually build the systems. Uh, and I think there's been a, been a lot of interesting work and, and a lot of interesting projects. And, and now we really need to, to, to demonstrate. Yes. We, need to, we need to do it on, the ground, on and, the ground and show tangible that the regenerative economy, regenerative society is not only possible, but it's here and it's working yes. and we're having massive positive impact. Um, and it's the only way forward. Legitimately, it's the only it's way the forward. Only mm -hmm. way forward. Mm -hmm. So what is the path? Like, mm. how do we get there to that regenerative future? What yeah. pathways do you yeah. see? So what I'm really excited about is, is usually what you see in these big world-shifting changes uh, where the world order is disrupted. It's, it's, a, it's a period of great disruption yeah. and conflict. Um, there's a lot of kind of uh, work around, uh, around this, looking uh, at history. Um, and I think we do... You know, we're gonna be, it's going to be a turbulent time. Uh, we can already see this. It's kind of obvious. Uh, but we also have the opportunity, I think, with these tools to actually redesign and build the systems that we can, if we gather enough momentum, energy, people uh, within that, we can start to build this parallel system mm. of the future, the regenerative kind of economy and society, uh, and just more and more people can join. And suddenly we become a large enough force that we can uh, actually have 
global influence and global yes. presence to say, look, governments, look, big institutions, corporations, yes. the rest of the world. Look what we're doing, guys. We, we've mm. got the models here mm. and, it's we, working. and it's working and people are coming in. Uh, and so hopefully that facilitates a pathway to transition to this next um, generation mm world order and economy in a way that is as peaceful as it can be. Uh, and, you know, so so that's that's the hope, the dream. Yes. Uh, and that's what I want to work towards doing, uh, basically. But it seems like there's so many structural barriers to making mm. this possible. Like mm. the institutions that exist today are almost predisposed to prevent this kind of innovation to take place. Mm. And I think there's a lot of frustration that was born out of Balaji's work, the network state, around the regulatory and jurisdictional limitations of what we can actually build, mm. what we're allowed to experience with. And so I'd be curious to get your kind of overview of the kind of landscape of limitations, where these existing institutions are failing, mm. and how that is providing, you know, an enormous amount of pressure for this movement of innovation that's coming mm. through the crypto space, the AI space, the regenerative space. Like, where are the fissure points in existing systems? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. And I think it touches on that point around um, exit versus voice. And I, I totally resonate, uh, I think I, I resonated with the idea that like looking at the current systems and being like, holy, you know, they've, they've really messed this up. Like things are bad. And like there's that kind of tendency to want to go, well, we could just exit all of it and just mm. start again. And just, let's own. just build yep. the regenerative economy. These guys have all screwed up the world. Yep. Uh, some and, island, and, somewhere. You know, climate change, all, all of the existential problems, uh, the meta crisis, all of these things that we know we're facing. Um, but I think that is possibly, it's it's not where you should start, I think. Mm. It's not, I, I think, if we're actually serious about um, kind of making this a more tangible pathway, uh, I think it really helps to try and look towards how we can build bridges and take those with us. Uh, and ultimately, like you say, if we try and do it in a totally exit-based way, it's just going to create more conflict. And, you know, that it will be far easier to squash Right, sure. because it will just be look at those crazies doing these dangerous, you know, the narratives around it, and you get some kind of mm -hmm. extreme versions of, mm -hmm. of network states that I think are kind of really scary mm -hmm. um, happening, and that will be an easy vehicle for yeah. for Let, the people. And I just, think we should unpack what is the term network state in a second. But but first, there, there's a few key points, which is you know the regulatory uncertainty around digital assets is one of the most you know, significant limitations to cultural and financial innovation that I've ever seen. Mm. You know, there's enormous amount of creative energy flowing into technology, and it's all digital. Mm. And, you know, to digitize assets, to digitize land, digitize property, digitize intellectual property, like, this is essential for us mm. to figure out a way forward to solve these global coordination challenges. Yeah. And yet you have actors like the SEC who are, you know, regulating via enforcement in really pernicious ways, claiming that everything is a security without actually following the procedures that the law specifically dictates mm. and you have this strangulated environment and so i really do understand like why a lot of the kind of silicon valley culture is pushing out beyond the boundaries of the united states trying to find land that is you know amenable and open to radical experimentation some mm. people are obsessed with longevity and you know we're all into regeneration but it feels like there is this suffocating canvas of mm. legal possibility that just isn't allowing us to figure out the way forward. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's this on one hand, and the other is just, like, blatant disregard for what the science is saying. The fact that there's still so many trillion dollars of fossil fuel subsidies is, you know, frankly, just a blatant testament to the failure of these institutions. They've mm. been completely co-opted by corporate shareholder interests. Like, it's, it's not even a game anymore. It's just funny. It's like, okay, the system is fundamentally broken. Mm. And I don't believe the nation state can solve these problems. Mm. Do you? I think that we need to develop new institutional structures that complement and intertwine with nation state structures and other institutions. Um, we, we can get more into this. This is the coordination stuff that I'm like, I'm loving. <laughs> uh, I'm but, but first of all, a quick note on some of the other stuff uh, that you've kind of brought up there. Mm -hmm. I think there is a little bit of a tension between the kind of move fast and break things, Silicon Valley mindset, mm -hmm. and the kind of move slow, do things well considered, and bringing everyone with you in this kind of almost, you know, more participatory and democratic mm -hmm. way. Community and on one side, there's the tension of, okay, well, I mean, the climate crisis can't wait. Like, we need, <laughs> we need radical, right you know, now. stuff fast. But at the same time, I think there's a sort of danger in this idea of saying, you know, like, oh, these nations have all these pesky regulations and, and bureaucracy, which, you know, there are many problems uh, and stuff like that. But regulation and bureaucracy is 
there as a purpose to try and protect against some of the existential risks uh, to and, and to include more people. And we can, of course, mm-hmm. there's, there's it's fundamentally broken in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of cracks. And um, but I think there's a, there's a slightly scary undertone to the idea of we need to liberate you know elite Silicon Valley billionaires <laughs> to go and experiment <laughs> with the most advanced exponential yeah. technologies in their own little totally. kind of regulatory havens. Um, and I think that's that's a scary idea to me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You know, I'm all for experiments <laughs> in this positive direction, but yeah. who's to decide what's positive? And yeah. uh, and um, you know, it's it's a tricky one because I, I mm-hmm. can see I can see both the drive for experimentation and innovation, mm-hmm. um, of course, but also the desire to kind of slow down and reconsider these things. Yes. And yes. technology has been so disruptive, and we're mm-hmm. seeing mm-hmm. so much disruption that, that actually society we can't even. We haven't even properly managed to deal with all the effects of the internet era and all of the stuff that that's unlocking. And now we're slammed with the most incredible AI systems yes. that are doing all of these awesome things. But at the same time, that's uh, you know, there's a lot of scary potential there. And we, we're talking about exponential technologies in the power of uh, individual <laughs> dumb apes. That's what I got. <laughs> right? Like, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, it can be scary. but um, yeah, For sure. So... For those listening, I mean, a lot of our community are familiar with this concept of a network state. But for those that aren't, you know, we're far enough in, I think it's very important to define the term itself and look at its ramifications and why it's gathered so much mimetic energy. Uh, what is a network state? Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I think we can, we can look at the original take of Bology uh, in his book, um, A Network State, how to, how to Start a New Nation. And he defines it as a highly aligned online community that has a capacity for collective action that actually then crowdfunds territory in the mm-hmm. real world. Um, and then this final piece of eventually gaining some form of diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he kind of kick-started that idea of, of actually having these online communities and social networks, but actually really bringing that into the real world um, and operating in this kind of globally dispersed new state-like mm-hmm. structure. Um, since then, I think there's been a lot of scrutiny on that. Um, uh, there's some lots of founders and, and people are building these new types of structures. Uh, but there's also a lot of divergence uh, in terms of some of the ideology and some of his conceptions of what it actually means and takes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some, some people are calling, you know, network states uh, as just more, you know, distributed communities and, and have different conceptions of it, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we can dive a bit further into Bology's take and some of the kind of uh, interesting areas that I think has really captivated people uh, mm-hmm. and and really inspired uh, this kind of movement, and also some of the kind of potentially problematic areas uh, that I think really need um, you know quite close scrutiny. Um, and and yeah, so that for me mm-hmm. is is a really interesting uh, area of exploration. Totally, yeah, and and I think for me, you know, when the idea first came out, like crypto Twitter was ablaze with attention around this notion. And there were a lot of people pushing me being like, yo, refi DAO is a network state. Like, look at it. You have this online community of founders that believe in a better world using the power of Web3, that people on the planet can live together in harmony if the economic system is designed with that as the core modality. And then on the other hand, you know, you have all these local events that you're distributing through refi spring. And bring those two together and you have a network state, right? Mm-hmm. And I was really resistant to it because it just felt like another meme and it just felt like another fad. But when I was sitting with Simmer Mangit, um, general partner at Magic Ventures and, yeah, very successful entrepreneur hosted a Refi podcast season two, you know, we really went into the core concept in the architecture despite some of the small nuances of what Balaji's seemingly tainted perspectives given his background as a super high-tech venture capitalist um, it felt like there was some essence to this model that was mm. necessary for this just mm. transition to a regenerative economy. And I remember from a very young age, just telling my, my father, who was very politically active in the U.S. on the right wing, like, I just don't believe in the system. Like, nations will never solve these problems. Mm. Like, I'm not American, Dad. Like, and it was a very hard thing for him to hear. Like, I have no national identity. I'm mm. not a part of this system. This is mm. not where I belong. Mm. We need a mm. new identity. And we need a new way to coordinate value globally. Because if we don't solve these global problems, like the refugees knocking on the door in Europe or the refugees anywhere, will become a part of every broken and fractured society and will decay from within because we're not taking care of global issues. 
And so I'd be curious what your take was in terms of what the mimetic energy was that drew so much, you know, attention into this and has now resulted in some pretty, you know, well-capitalized experiments in Prospera and also in Zuzalu and, you know, folks in Zanzibar. Like, what do you think was the essence of the idea that drew so much attention? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think like you say, a lot of it is a, is a dissatisfaction with current systems, states, corporations, um, and that feeling of wanting to to start something afresh and mm. and and build community uh, in this new, more global kind of context and way, um, and yeah, I remember the initial kind of ideas around this regenerative network state, taking some of the, mm. the really interesting ideas of of how you form this decentralized you know society uh, with communities all over the globe, mm. and how you kind of create the infrastructure to coordinate globally and actually have real. Impact. I mean, we even had ideas of, you know, how could we participate at the Uni- United Nations and really bring mm-hmm. that voice of all the regenerative leaders and communities yeah. uh, to kind of create change in that way. Uh, and so we already, from the beginning, had this idea of working with nations yes, uh, yeah. a- as well. Um, but I think, yeah, I think there's the, the more other side of it, which is more the kind of let's really exit and, mm-hmm. and, and start our own thing and kind of plant Except our flag. Yeah. And, draw and, new boundaries. And draw new boundaries, yeah. right? This is where uh, it gets dangerous. Right? Super and, dangerous. and, you know, and then you, you talk about the capital coming in and that again is going to be like, well, we've got to look at the capital structures of, mm-hmm. of you can't, mm-hmm. we're, we're now mixing capital and state, <laughs> which mm-hmm. uh, we've Venture seen more, capital and, and we, ven- uh, Yeah, with those kind of returns. And you see that... Um, you know, it's potentially a pretty problematic uh, uh, a combination. Um, but also very attractive for the entire world, which is capitally driven, right? Mm, right. <laughs> it's like, right. it's always seeking returns. And like, mm. imagine investing in the United States as a founding mm. father. Mm. That is the most insane upside you could possibly imagine. So I understand why there's the attraction there. But you're saying that there's like a fundamental risk to this profile. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um you know, it, because it just becomes an extractive system that's then for actually accentuating some of the problems if it's led in a kind of elitist way, mm-hmm. um, um, in a, this kind of very too much emphasis on on founder and and um, kind of having yeah capital and founder. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. it's potentially a dangerous combination when we're talking about people's lives and living, yeah. and um, especially in marginalized communities, developing markets. Like right. this is where it gets super sensitive because yes. all the land in emerging markets is taken. You're not right. going to go and squat in Arizona. And exactly, grab a exactly. This is the point I was just about to make as well. Is yeah, where can a lot of these experiments go on? Well, you know. It's going to be very difficult to try and carve out a bit of land in, uh, you know, in Europe or wherever wherever it is. Uh, mm-hmm. Not that you, we even should be trying to do that, uh, but you know, clearly there's going to be a lot of experiments in you know less developed uh, countries, and then there's this kind of crypto colonialism kind of esque uh, side to it. Um, not to say that actually, if not di- if done in the right way, there couldn't mm. there couldn't be giant leaps in mm. in prosperity and kind of development and um, you know equality and, and actually really rejuvenating and bringing um, amazing new kind of uh, structures uh, that that are with and by the local people. And so mm-hmm. that's I think really one of the things that I think we've really tried to do with our model is it's not us. <laughs> it's not us doing starting mm. the new communities, right? Mm, mm. It's it's we put out some some podcasts, some blogs, uh, and hopefully some <laughs> and useful software together. tools yeah. uh, and, and community and, and kind of space building. Uh, and it's up to local founders and local communities to come in a in a basically totally decentralized and autonomous way. Like, I don't even know half of the local nerds, honestly. <laughs> I want to meet more of them because the ones that I have met, it's been amazing and inspiring and awesome. Mm, and I read mm. about the various ones. Uh, but it, but it's really coming from that local source to say, okay, what, is, what does regeneration look like in this local context? And how can we tap into these global systems, sources of, of, of funding, of expertise, of knowledge, of, of software, of insights, and, mm. and use that on the local level to actually implement this stuff on the yes, ground yes. Uh, and, and build it in their own local context instead of staying in this Web3 kind of crypto bubble uh, where we kind of always talking about these philosophical ideas. Living uh, in smart contracts. Right, and, and very code-based kind of uh, technocentric, techno solutionist kind of mindset. Um, you know, how do we really translate that mm-hmm. onto the ground uh, and and live it? Um, yes, yes. And I think this is such an interesting, you know, exfoliation of what is refi. You know, the unique combination of technology and culture, and also where is it falling short? 
because we're looking at the context of a network state through this lens. You know, we have a very, very rose-tinted pair of eyes, both you and I. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's many people who are as deep living and eating and breathing this stuff. And, like, it's mm. super niche, you know. Yet at the same time, ReFi is, you know, gaining popular recognition in Forbes and and Times Magazine and all these other places mm. as startups like KlimaDAO and Toucan and Region Network and Cello and Nori and Moss, you know, are, are making radical leaps forward towards, yeah. you know, the innovation that we need. So, yeah, first, what's your take on ReFi? What is it? <laughs> and then where is it falling short? And how does the network state fit within this new lens? Mm, mm. Wow, there's a lot there. I mean, first of all, it's been a really interesting journey uh, seeing the ReFi space be born and evolve. And there's been a lot of kind of shifts in, in, in developments and cycles. And, you know, we're at quite an interesting place now. Uh, but before we kind of get to that, I think, yeah, my, uh, my vision of, of regenerative finance is about how we redesign and reimagine and re-implement financial and economic systems in a way that is in alignment with people and planet. Yes. Um, and so to get there, I think we need all sorts of new experiments. Um, and so on one side of it, there's the redesigning the kind of market-based mechanisms. Uh, mm. We see carbon markets are now uh, evolving that towards um, ecological benefits, uh, biodiversity, um, soil, earth, water, um, equity, all of these concepts. Uh, but actually using the incredible uh, coordination mechanisms of markets uh, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and capitalism that they've been deployed and, and, and innovating those to to include these diverse forms of capital. So it's not mm. just financial capital. We see these eight forms of capital, whether it's yeah. social, material, living. Spiritual, um, and, intellectual, yeah. And, and, and how you do that to, to realize a more holistic view of what wealth actually is. And what we need to survive. And what we need to survive, yeah, for sure. Um, and so that's more on the side of like uh, regenerative capitalism, which is maybe some, for some people an oxymoron, but I think mm -hmm. that there is actually some really interesting experiments going on in that domain. Um, but at the same time, that's not the only domain. Like, I think there's been some incredibly fascinating experimentation in this post-capitalist mm -hmm. kind, of, mm -hmm. uh, um, kind of models, right? Where mm -hmm. we're actually, you know, the work of Ellen Ostrom on the commons and saying, okay, there's these market-based mechanisms that have been very prevalent, and there's the state-based mechanisms. But actually, how can we facilitate a kind of commons community-based management um, system of... of, of all of the things that you know mm -hmm. uh, that we share as as a human species, yeah, um, the resources we all need to survive, right? And and you're really demonstrating that those models are not only possible but actually already happening. And there's mm. a rich tapestry of examples of uh, uh, it. Just requires the um, you know certain set of structures uh, and sure. there's continued experimentation around how to improve and evolve that. And again, the technologies we're talking about have amazing potential to help facilitate that. Mm. And it, I would love to see so many more builders and founders and entrepreneurs come into this space. And we see amazing innovation in public goods and um, commons and governance. And I see a lot of this happening with some of the um, you know, the movements like, you know, Crypto Commons Association, uh, Blockchain Socialist, um, you know, the stuff that Griff and, uh, and Kevin mm -hmm. are doing and um, all of this amazing energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that's a really core part of this regenerative finance movement um, as well. Um, so, yeah, there's kind of two sides to it. Um, and I think one of the other key pieces for me as well is this regenerative governance mm. side of it as well. Because mm. it's not just about the market and financial and kind of yeah. commons mechanisms. It's actually how you how you govern that in a way that has longevity and isn't like creating the mechanisms for extraction over time um, and actually bringing people into that in a way that's actually effective as well. Because, you know, we've seen lots of experiments in democracy and DAOs and, you know, there's a lot of failures as well because mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. really complicated and difficult thing to coordinate all of those in an, in an effective way. And so... Yeah, I think there's there's been a lot of learning that's gone on in the DAO space and 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 also like centuries of learning in this as well. So I think, yeah, sure. uh, but also we've got incredible new tools as well. So, you know, some of the stuff I'm interested in is of course the kind of polycentric leadership uh, stuff. Again, uh, Ellen Ostrom's uh, got some awesome work here. Uh, and the liberating structures, shout out Jeremy and Regens Unite <laughs> for introducing me to this, uh, this amazing uh, set of tools to actually yep. have really engaging and participatory mm -hmm. uh, meetings. How do you actually involve everyone and, and almost facilitate collective intelligence uh, and having voice um, heard, um, totally. which is amazing. And of course, the ideas of sociocracy and holocracy, uh, deep democracy, about how you actually distribute power and decision-making in a way that's still effective and productive 
um, actually having explicit roles, accountabilities, mm -hmm. processes, high transparency, um, but still allowing decisions to be made and experiments to happen because totally. that's what startups are great at, doing lots yeah. of experiments in a fast mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. iterative way. Um, but at the same time, we need to make sure that people's needs and perspectives and voices and externalities and all of this are taken, well, a, taken into account. And it's and accessible considered. for people to actually participate into this. Yeah, and so th there's a lot there, but I think there's, there's one kind of super narrative that emerged as I was listening to you speak, which is, you know, out of the industrial age, you know, with um, these new machines and a global form of money, we were able to coordinate value to all the corners of the earth, you know, more quickly and more effectively than ever before. And with an economic system that's designed to optimize for GDP, like we're just funneling all human effort and attention mm. towards producing goods and services, regardless of the cost. And we had the kind of, you know, post-war capitalism versus communism battle between the USSR and the United States. And we now live in this kind of global post-truth capitalist society where we're watching the disintegration of all of the existing systems that we've built to date as a result of 8 billion plus people on the planet, putting strain on every planetary boundary possible. Mm. And suddenly out of the financial collapse of 2008, you have Bitcoin as this radical new form of money that doesn't rely on any of the existing institutions mm. at all. It's completely separate. And most people laughed at it, but what we've seen is it's you know the building block and foundation for an entire new way of governing all the shared resources that we have. And with Ethereum, we look at this incredible network that allows people to build any application that you could possibly think of with a Turing-complete programming language on this idea of a decentralized public ledger that Bitcoin pioneered and has proven to be so incredibly effective. And so I think what's fascinating here is just watching these like evolutionary paradigms as mm. humanity's going through this process of figuring out how to survive on Earth with the growth at this rate of population and resource extraction. And now, you know, this decentralized concept and some of the core philosophies are saying, hey, let's not only redesign money, let's redesign organizations, institutions, mm. and the very core mechanisms of how we actually live together. Mm. And I think this is where the network state becomes so fascinating because it really is a full holistic sandbox for creating an entirely new society at a local level and pushing those local communities through network effects to make influence at a global level. Mm. And so I, I'm curious to hear yeah, your, your take on like, it seems you're relatively pessimistic around the venture capital driven, you know, um, sovereign land, your own boundaries uh, type of network state model. But what else have you seen? I know you've done a lot of work in the community, reading, engaging, hosting workshops. Like what's the sentiment around this? And what are the other models there that you're actually excited about that can actually make this happen. Yeah, sure. So this is this is the part where we get to talk about coordinations. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, there's been a lot of interesting work going on. Um, shout out to Blockchain Gov, uh, Primavera Di Filippi, uh, and Josh on the Blockchain Socialist, which I've been listening to intently. Um, it, they have a series called uh, Overthrowing the Network State, uh, and I highly recommend um, people, people give that a listen. Um, but, you know, I think it keeps some of these ideas that I think have been really exciting and attractive to many people, um, the idea of going beyond these kind of nation-state boundaries um, to actually facilitate these networked global organizations, um, but do it in a way that actually leverages these structures in a way that actually creates more participatory structures, democracy, decentralization, uh, and actually integration and, and network sovereignties that actually can integrate with current, current structures uh, in a way that helps to kind of realign and re-guide um, the, these, these structures in a, in a way that's more kind of a positive direction. Um, and so, yeah, it's really this new institutional structure that's focusing less on exit-based sovereign states uh, and more around the kind of nation concept, which is mm -hmm. uh, nation. It, it, it's kind of a, a, um, a, a, a an extended take on, on what it means to be a nation, which previously you might define as as actually sharing cultural heritage and and mm -hmm. kind of geographical background. With a um, certain geographic boundary, right? But there's also the idea of a shared culture and shared mm. values, and mm. so that I think is one of the foundational parts of what it means to be a new. Uh, a nation, right? And, mm -hmm. and like you say, a lot of people grow up in nations that they don't necessarily espouse the the values of um, mm -hmm. and, and see actually relate much more strongly 
um, to a to a different form of mm. uh, of community. A nation and that's, in the cloud. A nation in the cloud, and that's what uh, the internet and, and these tools kind of unlock is to is to form these new communities. Mm. But I think one of the dangers is that you it becomes almost an accentuating this tribal like um, dynamics, right? Of of mm. Of wanting to only exist in your in your echo chamber bubble of mm. um, you know these all people all agree with me and and and, uh, and even not only now I'm being in these spaces online in these kind of echo chambers but also now actually living with only other people that share the same views and mindsets uh, with me um, and so one of the things I think that's really interesting in this coordination concept as well is participating in multiple networked sovereignties yeah. uh, and, and uh, communities, uh, and also including many more stakeholders. So um, it may be that the local people uh, in, the, the, the nation, in the surrounding area where you actually uh, have land, uh, you actually involve those stakeholders in the process, in all of the governance considerations, mm. uh, the externalities. And so instead of going at it this hyper-individualistic, kind of libertarian kind of mm. way, which we've mm. all seen that if you focus too much on the individual, it harms the collective and externalities sure. exist, sure. Um, it, it is how can we take all of those things into account and really create these much more participatory mm -hmm. structures and, and exist yeah. in multiple kind of coordinations um, it, with identities, multiple identities. Yeah, and I think like... <laughs> There's there's a desire to move away from words and ideas that cause conflict in general. Mm. And the idea of a coordination feels more like a game and it feels more fun and social and playful than a network state because of the word state. Mm. You know, so I think there is some key terminologies and you know, Balaji as a character has kind of diluted the whole notion of a network state because of the way he's behaved, you know, in various mm. ways and some of the things that he said. Whereas this coordination concept seems to be more of like a community, grassroots, bottom up you know, idea that is being formed in this mm -hmm. time. And, and I think there's a lot of appeal there. I think one of my concerns is that, you know, it seems to me to be still disconnected from the land, from the soil, from physical trees and physical places that actually do need to be brought into this economy. And I'll give a shout out to the folks at Oasa and the traditional dream factory here in Portugal for having the courage to say, hey, we're going to buy, you know, a pretty significant plot of land here to build a village. And we're going to put that land on chain but we're going to lock it up in an earth trust so that mm. it can never be sold and it has to be governed by regenerative principles. And this to me was one of the core ideas that I really enjoyed about the network state was this push to acquire land mm. and to put it towards the work of whatever the purpose of this community in the cloud serves and in our yeah. case to regenerate the earth. Mm. And I think for me, I just I feel a really deep dissatisfaction with basically the whole Web3 space of living in this massive bubble mm. and having like conference tours of conference tours of conference tours flying all around the world, destroying the planet through our consumption, you know, eating ridiculous food that has absolutely no mm. awareness tethered mm. to it, expending huge amounts of resources, partying and celebrating, and then like pretending that we create these coordination vehicles that actually make a difference when we're not planting trees together. Yeah. We're not taking plastic out of the ocean. We're not serving the homeless. Like there's no action being taken. We're mm. just assuming that the tech platforms we build will make a difference one day. Mm. But I don't buy it. Mm. Like I, I think we need to get land. We need to preserve the earth. We need to take action. And without that, like everything is meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think it, I think just pausing on on what TDF are doing Super, super exciting stuff. It's traditional dream factory is a regenerative village um, just outside or, or south of, of, of Lisbon. I'm going there tomorrow. I can't <laughs> wait. Uh, uh, just to, to shill them a little bit, you can buy tokens. They've got... Uh, <laughs> Monty gets no upside. I, yeah, I mean, well, it's on a bonding curve, but uh, it, you also... <laughs> shout out Griff as well, you know. <laughs> um, uh, common stack and all that, yeah. Um, but... Yeah, so it's it's a super exciting model, I think, um, and it's yeah, it's it's really pioneering how we can actually uh, live in in a in a regenerative way. So it's, like you say, it's bringing it into the real world, and I think it's based on a lot of insights of traditional eco village concepts uh, that have been around for a long time, right? And and you know, it's it's appealing and to a bunch, uh, you know. But what actually has it has it has happened is you have a bunch of hippies, kind of basically, um, <laughs> who go live on, on a plot of land together, and and great, like there's not a negative impact uh, on the environment, but it also it doesn't scale, um, and it sort of you become this isolated commune um, that also is quite disconnected from mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Sure, um, and you know it's also not appealing to 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 a large majority of people. But I think 
when you talk about regenerative villages, there's this experimentation with how can we be more connected, uh, right? Actually integrate. To existing uh, villages, existing towns around surrounding, us. Surrounding, yeah. right, exactly. And relationship with those people, 100%. Yes, yes, and using modern technologies in a way that actually creates uh, different forms of standards of living and you know maybe you're more you want more private space or maybe you want to mm-hmm. lean in more to the to the shared space and, and a pluralistic kind of approach um and and yeah so it's it's about this kind of regenerative uh, way of living but also then you look at the, how you can augment that with the tools of refi and web3 mm. to actually mm. create um governance structures that actually ha- have more fluidity um, sure. and you know they're doing a lot of stuff proof of presence and sweat mm. tokens and and so I think this is a really interesting aspect because you saw a lot of I think like like startups uh, you know 90 X percent of of regel- of eco villages have failed um, yep. and so how can we innovate on that domain mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to actually make that a scalable model and have a network of these villages all around the world um, and also, you know, they're plugging into the tools of refi. So they're, they're, they have a food forest there. They're planting uh, a, a kind of a larger forest and, and engaging with open forest protocol to, to actually Major have an export and of, of credits from, yeah. from, from that um, uh, settlement. So, yeah, it's a super interesting model. I, I guess my, my question is like, what do you think about that challenge for the notion of a coordination? That it then just becomes a community in the cloud that comes together so, and hangs out cool. if there's no land involved? I, th- I don't think that coordinations are, are trying to be purely in the cloud. I think they they're, they're very much can be um, this, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a focus on in-person communities mm. as well. But if there's no land, like land is the key to this whole transition. It's mm. about land use. Mm. It's mm. about physical matter being regenerated. We have to restore microbes in the soil. Yeah. We have to purify water. We yeah. have to restore biodiversity. Absolutely. Without that, none of this works. Absolutely. So I think I, I totally agree. And if we can facilitate models where it's the local people and the local founders who are acquiring that land, putting it in this trust-like model, uh, and we provide some frameworks that help to think about these things to help institute in a regenerative way and crucially then connect to the sources of funding which help support that at a local level mm. so that again there's not this danger of you know when people hear acquiring land they're they're probably thinking you know we're trying to acquire land all over the world and mm. and you know mm. plant our flag and and again it's this kind of it's colonial local community uh, but but if it's this model of it's the local community coming and really taking ownership of their of mm-hmm. their land and resources and regenerating it and seeing how that can actually build wealth for yes. them as a yes. commons and actually it's an asset that they should mm. be reaping the reward of. For sure. Um, in and regenerative ways. In regenerative ways, exactly. And so we can help connect with the tools, the sources of capital, which are actually going to help benefit them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, be connected into this global um, the, kind of community. The collective yeah. intelligence is, is hard to understate. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of incredible collaboration going on online through these local communities gathering. And I, I think one of the interesting phenomena we've seen was you know, after Kevin Waukee stepped down from Gitcoin DAO and kind of um, started his path at Supermodular and started the podcast Green Pill, you know, he really jumped into this regenerative economic framework and helped to popularize it in the kind of Web3 degen space, which has done an amazing service mm-hmm. because I think that whole totally. space needed it. And he was a key influencer to turn the tide. Mm-hmm. You know, he's now obviously got the pod with Bankless and Bankless was how I got into the space. So, you know, there's a real significant cultural shift happening here. And it was fascinating seeing at ETH Denver, you know, we give a shout out to Sejal saying, hey, if you want to start a local chapter, like come talk to us. And so there's this recognition that these online communities also recognize the need to gather locally. Mm. And, you know, we now have uh, 18 refi down nodes. We've hosted events in 58 cities, you know, 75 events over the last 12 months. And Green Pill is, you know, on a similar, even possibly more impressive growth trajectory, probably more in more emerged market, developed markets. But what do you think is happening here with this pattern? Is this something that's just going to keep continuing where we'll see online communities gathering locally, Mm. online communities gathering locally? And in our context, like, what does it mean then to have all these different slightly adjusted expressions of the same idea? I love that. Yeah, and totally. I think it's a it's a new model that we're going to see many new experiments with, uh, and in quite an exciting way. Uh, and I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is how we facilitate collaboration across these communities. Yeah. Um, and so I love Green Pill. Uh, I mean, I listen to the podcast. I'm a huge believer in in the work and same. and what Kevin's same. done for the space. It's amazing. Like I'm Green Pill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the potential of Refi and and some of the amazing things that are going on there. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I see it all as part of this. And Regens Unite. Hell yeah, let's do that. I, I've been to many of these re, a couple of the Regens Unite events, and they're amazing fun, beautiful so group cool. of people. Bringing and such so, like, good groups together. What excites me is is 
what are the structures and the ways that we can facilitate the synergistic kind of positive sum collaboration between mm. these communities. And again, I think this coordination concept um, is really powerful. It's how do we weave kind of interconnectedness and interdependence so that we really recognize that we're, I mean, we're all in, we're all in it together. We're all in it for mm. regeneration. So let's, yes. let's go. Let's, uh, let's, do let's coordinate and support each other. Um, and it's not just like a, um, a kind of a, a, um, a collaboration just for the sake of it. It's also like, we'll, we'll all reap the benefits from it. Like uh, totally. there's this idea of the economies of scope, yes. um, which yes. is that, you know, we, we have certain functions that each of our communities, and you see it a lot, it, um, we'll all need, and we'll all build our own solutions in these isolated bubbles. And I mean, it happens a lot in the startup space and mm. happened in mm. the early refi space and, and everywhere because we're not connected uh, and coordinated at quite the same uh, capacity because it's difficult to do that at scale. Um, but economies of scope is, okay, like, um, how can we each focus on, on a piece of the puzzle uh, and combine that in a way that creates public goods for the whole network? Yes. So you have this synergistic collaboration of maybe we develop a passport thing, uh, we can share all our books, guides, and resources, and mm. everyone benefits from mm. um, what's contributed and benefits more from... And the pluralism's key. You know, I think Gitcoin Passport was like this initial stamp around digital identity in this space, but they heavily focused on the principle of decentralization. It's like a decentralized digital identity solution. Mm. Whereas for me, you try and onboard normal people who aren't into Web3 mm. and Gitcoin, you literally cannot do it. It's impossible. I tried. Like we hosted events here and all over. It's like you can't do it mm. because of the way that the mechanism set up to emphasize for decentralization. Whereas I think there's the other side to say, hey, well, what if there was an identity solution where, you know, you could take a photo of your ID and use something like Onfido and just get verified because you have an existing address. You know, mm. we need a pluralist expression of mm. how to solve for these different puzzle pieces. Yeah. And I think you know, knowing that there's people that need to be onboarded, knowing that there's people who are already here, like the, the biggest opportunity for me is people outside this movement who don't have crypto wallet, who don't mm, have keys, mm. and who want a place to belong. Mm. Ultimately, that's what we're offering in, in the Web3 space is like, this is the coolest place to be mm. because you can come, there's opportunities to earn money, you can do good, you can make an impact, and there's a bunch of people who will support you along the way. And yeah. it's really, really fun. And I think that is something that's often overlooked because of the like, financialized technology side of it. It's like mm. the best communities are often Web3 communities. There's such good people here. And so I think the idea of bringing these networks together to build towards a, sh a shared goal and a common good has huge, huge potential. And I'm curious, like, what are the next steps towards that? What would help to bring that kind of cross-network collaboration to life? Yeah, sure. And just touching on, on, on one of the points there as well, I, I totally agree. I think it's, it's both uh, Regens Unite and I, I think at ReFiDAO events, we've seen that, you know, uh, from our own experience, 70% of the people turning up there are not in the Web3 space. Yep. And it's creating those bridges uh, where the ideas can flow around so we can, again, move out of the bubble of Web3 and implement these amazing technologies with mm -hmm. the other regenerative impacts, leaders, ESG, you know, all, all of these things that are already happening and, and facilitate this interconnection and the bridges uh, and implementation. So... I think that's really exciting. Um, and on, on the pluralism of community side as well, you, you look at it, uh, you know, Green Pill brings us very kind of builder, crypto, mm, software. awesome innovation in, in that side of it. Uh, more of public a focus, goods. Of, uh, yeah. public goods, this kind of stuff. Uh, Regens Unite is very kind of earthy and, and participatory and, and mm -hmm. kind of uh, this kind of thing. Um, and yeah, Refi DAO is, is carving out its own space in that as well. And um, I want, I'm, I, I involved, I'm, I belong to all three, I think. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is awesome to see. Um, and so, yeah, so now I've lost track of the, the question. Well, just saying, like, how do we bring these networks together? Like, what, what yes. is the step for to test this hypothesis yes. that yes. actually we're stronger together and we yes. need to really live out this potential of global mm -hmm. coordination? So one of the things that I'm, I've been proposing in the Refidel Forum uh, and starting to make um, kind of um, build um, ideas around is... is all getting together in, in a Gitcoin round together and um, having a, a match pool that's put up by both of our um, communities um, and then letting all of the, the local nodes come in to then facilitate mm -hmm. this kind of giant global... Green pill um, chapters, refi local chapters, nodes. Refi local nodes. Yeah, amazing. Exactly. And then um, it lays the foundation for other online communities to gather locally with this shared exactly. purpose of regeneration yes. but a different take. Yes. And projects that are providing public goods to the entire local node yeah. kind of infrastructure can come into the round as well with an effect with a governance process, of course, totally. that allows them into the round. Um, and then they can provide services to the entire network. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I've been having some good conversations um, about, you know, a, a writer's guild and a translator's guild and certain working mm -hmm. groups and certain technologies and the knowledge graph that we're building. How can we implement that across all of our communities um, in this kind of 
shared uh, way uh, where we're all allowing to specialize on what we're doing best at, but actually benefit from mm -hmm. the um, goods of, e of, of each other. So Love it. That's, Love it, that's what I'm excited about. We'll see how it yeah. ends up. And well, there's a lot of... Because um, I think at the end of the day, it's not about any brand. Mm. It's about getting people into these systems that can be designed with regeneration in mind and getting capital flow towards impact. Mm. You know, it, it really doesn't matter because if we don't solve that problem, we all lose. Mm. Like this is coordination failure at its finest at mm. a global level mm. with billions of lives at risk. Yeah. And so I think it really is, you know, a, a constant invitation for each of us in this movement to put our own like individualistic uh, incentives aside and recognize that this actually is the greatest opportunity in all of human history to build something for generations to come amidst all adversity. And we need to figure out how to work together. Like, yeah. it's as simple as that. And yeah, yeah. it's incredibly hard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But what better time than in the, in the, in the dark depths of the bear market, uh, yes. in the capitulation <laughs> zone that we're in? You yeah. know, because the people who are left, you know, we're the people who are actually in this for the right reasons, maybe. Yes. Uh, the builders, <laughs> uh, the committed regens. Uh, and so, yeah, like, let's take this time to band together, to, to, to really build the right structures and the social capital and the networks mm. and, and then start to layer on more advanced governance and organizational systems and tokens and interwined mm. incentives and all of the kind of crazy stuff that we could do. Um, and so when, when this kind of surge of momentum comes back and, and we kind of peering up out of the valley of despair <laughs> uh, and we learn what these technologies are actually good for and they're applied in the right place and we have the time to develop them properly yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're out of the kind of crazy hype cycle of the beginning the and the kind exuberance. of the rational exuberance and now the capitulation of uh, 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 of this kind of bear market um, so I think I'm starting to get excited I'm Amazing. starting to see <laughs> to, to peer up and go guys what's next let's uh, let's do this <laughs> totally totally man but at the same time it's okay to be low and like hey mm. there's not as much money flowing around there's not many opportunities people are losing jobs you know and it's hard yeah like it's tough and uh, the the words of Griff Green at Eat Denver really resonated with me just saying yo all you got to do is survive <laughs> all you got to do is last through the bear and once the bull comes along it's infinite money time <laughs> so it's all good <laughs> which is totally the case <laughs> which is totally the case yeah. but you know I, I think we're both new into the scene there's people um, g true giants on whose shoulders we are standing mm. and we can rely on those those eyes and the wisdom that have seen several cycles to know that this is a pattern and uh, you know sentiment changes and ultimately at the end of the day it's about story mm. I think that's one of the most interesting things in Web3 is just recognizing, yes, the technology is what makes it possible, but it's storytelling that drives attention. Mm. And um, it's time for us to write a new story. And so I'm really, really excited. A story excited. of implementation <laughs> <laughs> and results. <laughs> I'm actually doing real stuff. What, where do we go from here? What's the next tw 12 to 24 months looking like, both for Refi DAO and also this like idea of you know, regen coordinations coming together to mm. make a difference? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's to continue building the foundations that we've already set in motion and to continue focusing on this building the social layer and the community layer and the network layer, but also actually bringing in now um, our product visions that can help to really accelerate that and connect and, and provide all these useful tools to help us coordinate in a better way. Um, and then, yeah, layering on the, the governance structures that are going to get us there and, mm -hmm. and all of these kind of exciting bits. Uh, and yeah, this going on this transition towards real community ownership and yes. participation and governance. Totally. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a long-term journey. It's, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, these are really complicated, difficult, nuanced um, things to implement. Uh, and I think we've seen in a lot of Web3 projects that maybe go too early in this direction, launch a token, you know, launch a, a governance system, or they experience a great influx of capital. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. creates this mad rush and toxic. mistakes are made and uh, conflict happens. And so if we build really robust social layer and culture and alignment uh, and, and all of that kind of stuff first and start to layer in, you know, these really interesting um, participatory governance practices, sociocracy, liberating structures, disco, uh, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, and then that, then we bring in the tokens mm -hmm, and the on-chain mm -hmm. governance yeah, and foundation. all of this kind of stuff. I feel like that, to me, feels like a pathway of we can create a truly sustainable and regenerative totally. global organization 
with all of these other Regen Align um, actors, uh, not just even Green Pill and Regens Unite, but all of the other refi, mm-hmm. Regen mm-hmm. aligned projects, protocols, totally. communities to get them implemented on the get ground, get them implemented, and 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 also connected to this global organization mm-hmm. kind of substrate uh, in a way could be really interesting to explore. So yeah, I guess my call to action is 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 to come come join and come explore this stuff with me, like uh, with us and and the entire network of of communities around the globe. I think we need so much uh, innovation and ideas here. And, um, you know, we've got a ReFiDAO forum, uh, which uh, I've run a couple sessions on. Our last one was on this network state topic, um, but we're going to have many more. And, you know, come contribute your thoughts and ideas and you'll see how, how it manifests uh, uh, in, in the kind of ideas and content that comes, comes through. So um, that for me is, is really exciting. Uh, and of course, if you want to go a step beyond, join a local community, start a local community, host an event, facilitate these conversations and build and implement. Let, and let's do this. Let's do it together. <laughs> Love it, man. Love it. And for all those builders out there discouraged, feeling like you ain't got a way out, just know that regeneration is inevitable. At the end of the day, the science is incredibly clear. We have one path forward, which is to figure out how to actually care for our water, our soil, our air, our neighbors, and ourselves. And so if you're drawn to the story of regeneration, of doing the work within and the work in the world around you, we'd love to have you at one of our monthly events here in Lisbon. We've been hanging out. We've had nine events over the last six months, reached almost a thousand people, some incredible leaders across public, private, and third sector institutions. And there's now cities all over the world that are gathering monthly to talk about this story and ultimately to take action. You can also see us at the annual meeting in November. Check your inbox for an invite. We are growing an incredible mass here, preparing to plant more trees in Portugal in a single day than in any other day in history and to prove it publicly. So stay tuned, join us for the ride. And yeah, it's been a good time. Thanks, Monty. <laughs> awesome. Peace. Peace, <laughs>